Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong, our premier location in Asia, representing U Chicago values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. Welcome to the Pop Asia series. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the U Chicago Yuen campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit our website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest news and information, or you can also follow us on our UChicago UN campus social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll wrap up tonight's program with a poll again and more information about upcoming events. You may be interested in the future, so please be sure to stay tuned until the very end. The Pop Asia series takes on topics that originate in Asia and impact the rest of the world. Tonight, we continue our Pop Asia video games mini series. Last week, we talked about video games and game studies in the 21st century. This week, we'll explore the different gaming cultures that are observed in the United States and Asia with a particular focus on China, Japan, and South Korea. We'll hear more about these gaming cultural differences through tonight's conversation. So let's get started with brief introductions of our guest speakers. Jennifer DeWinter is Professor of Arts, Communications, and Humanities at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. She researches computer production and global circulation. Professor DeWinter is particularly interested in the cross-media vampirism of entertainment media with a focus on computer games and Japan. She's long been interested in how local culture moves internationally. And she spent a number of years analyzing anime, comics, and computer games as part of the global media flows in order to understand how concepts such as art, culture, and entertainment are negotiated. In 2003, Professor DeWinter joined the Learning Games Initiative. And since joining WPI, she's been an active faculty member in the Interactive Media Game Development Program, advising students and teaching courses in game theory and practice. Tara Fickle is Associate Professor of English at the University of Oregon and affiliated faculty of the Department of Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies, the Center for Study of Women in Society and the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies. Professor Fickle's research and teaching interests include Asian and Asian American literature, game studies, and digital humanities and comic studies. Her first book, The Race Card, From Gaming Technologies to Model Minorities, a winner of the Before Columbus Foundation's American Book Award in 2019, explores how games have been used to establish and combat Asian and Asian American racial stereotypes. She's also co-editing a book, Made in Asia America, an anthology on Asian American game studies that brings together game scholars and designers. Professor Fickle is also currently working on a digital archive and analysis of the canonical Asian American anthology, i.e., with additional research projects on Chinese gold farming and radicalized dimensions of esports. Sei Young Kim is an assistant professor of cinema studies program at Colby College. He's currently working on a book project titled Asian Violence, the neoliberal cinema of South Korea and Japan that analyzes violent crime of East Asia produced between 1998 and 2008 in relation to the collapse of the bubble economy and the 1997 financial crises. He's also currently working on a project that charts the militarization of American culture following 9-11, from cinema and television to video games and children's toys. His research and teaching interests include cinema and digital media in the US and East Asia, with a focus on the use and meaning of violence in media. And finally, we have Professor Patrick Jagoda from the University of Chicago. Professor Jagoda is Professor of Cinema and Media Studies and English at the University of Chicago. He's Executive Editor of Critical Inquiry and Director of the Weston Game Lab. 
He's also co-founder of the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab and Transmedia Story Lab, and a member of the Forecast Lab Collective. Patrick's books include Network Aesthetics, The Game Worlds of Jason Rohrer, and Experimental Games, Critique, Play, and Design in the Age of Gamification. He's currently working on his next book, Story Lab, Narrative Methods for a Transmedia Era. Patrick has designed numerous alternate reality games, video games, and board games about issues that include climate change, public health, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Patrick's a recipient of the 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Patrick, I'll hand the stage over to you so that you can start the conversation. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, and thank you for uh, all of our guests at this event. Um, so today we want to discuss video game cultures across Asia and the United States. Uh, and I'll st start with Tara. Uh, so Tara, your work has approached video games as a cultural phenomenon, including in the US, China, and Japan. Uh, what do you make of the fact that video games are so often treated, uh, on the one hand, as deeply problematic, addictive, violent, and antisocial, but also simultaneously as a panacea for education and global problems, such as an aid for social distancing during COVID-19? And then do you see these extreme cultural positions uh, playing out differently in Asia versus North America? Yeah, I think it partly boils down to how debates over gaming are also frequently debates over what's considered socially legitimate, what kinds of values a society wants to have or be seen as having at any kind of given moment. Um, and consider something like physical sports, which video games obviously have a lot in common with. So think about how kind of objectively violent many of these physical team sports are, you know, American football, rugby, hockey. Um, to the point that if the same things that happen on the field there happen off the field, they'd be, you know, criminally prosecutable. But in the context of the game, and this is something that Professor Sparrow discussed in the last episode, are required by the very definition of what a game is, right, introducing these artificial obstacles. But at the same time, those objectively violent team games are also regarded as kind of uniquely positive sources of social skill building and leadership for children. And especially as a kind of professional organization are um, seen as a kind of social trampoline for underprivileged groups. So the question of sort of, you know, which is it? Is American football violent or is it a path away from violence? It's both. Um, and I think the same is true for video games. It really depends on which angle you're looking from. So for example, in my book, I look at some of the early language around um, internet addiction and online gaming disorder. And you talked about this in the first episode as well. And looking back at around 2013 or so um, in the American Psychiatric Association's um, decision not to include internet gaming disorder as a sort of true behavioral addiction was partly according to the difficulty establishing criteria for it. So, you know, according to other behavioral addiction criteria, if you were to um, apply that to online behavior, it was something like, you know, spending more than five hours a day online, that would end up, you know, pathologizing most people uh, just from the big amount of time that they spend online for work, for example, um, or secondarily, things like, um, you know, behavioral consequences of addiction would be something like irritability or emotional upset about gaming outcomes. Well, that would end up meaning that most people who are, you know, avid fans of sports would be considered gaming addicts by that criteria. So uh, in that sense, you know, I don't mean to suggest that obviously addiction isn't real and especially gambling addiction has been well established, um, but just to note how certain forms are kind of stigmatized so that others appear more normal. So ultimately I think that it has less to do with something inherent in games themselves and more about the context. Um, the last thing that I'll say though, is that it's been interesting how certain genres of games have been those that have been framed as um, benevolent, safe, uh, positive during COVID. So we're talking about games, you know, that are often branded as casual, a really gendered term, right? Often associated with female gamers versus hardcore games. Games that are casual and in a kind of orientalist um, trope, cute games, zen games, right? Are the ones that are supposed to be 
um, appealing during COVID. We're talking about games like Animal Crossing or even things like Minecraft or you know, a host of games that you see on the new Apple Arcade. We're not talking about you know, Call of Duty. And so um, it's interesting though, and, and in my own work, and I can talk about this more later, of course, those seemingly cute and safe games really disguise their own kinds of history, especially of things like, you know, for example, we're talking about Pokemon Go, uh, Japanese imperialism, American settler colonialism. Um, so it's interesting, I think, that there are a couple of different ways you could account for those seeming contradictions. Great, thank you for getting us started, Tara. That's really interesting. And the, and the concept of cuteness maybe uh, will connect a little bit to the, the next context that I wanna move uh, to. Um, so I'll move to Jennifer. And uh, Jennifer, you've extensively studied the history of video games in Japan. Uh, and Japan has the third largest video game market in the world currently after China and the United States. Um, and you know, could you uh, start off by giving us a sense of how Japanese game culture has changed from its emergence in the 1970s to the kind of like Nintendo, Sega console wars in the 1980s uh, to the present day when Nintendo continues to thrive, including with many kind of cute characters, whether it's Pokemon or Mario, um, uh, as well as a broader culture of JRPGs, visual novels, and much else. And then how has the Japanese game industry influenced both the United States and the global state of video game play? Yeah, thank you so much. So I think the the challenge with Japan, right, is that it's always internationalized. And so I can start talking about some of the things that were happening in Japan, but immediately it starts crossing over into the US context and then into the global context as the US is a culture broker. Um, and so uh, often people will look at Nintendo being the significant starting moment of the Japanese video game industry. Uh, it, it comes out of a trading card company. They go into other industrial design products. They're doing arcade cabinetry and uh, they decide to go into the home with the family computer, the Famicom. Uh, and, and in many ways like that, uh, that situational naming indicates the entire business strategy of Nintendo, right? Like it's not about gamers, it's about families coming together. And we'll see that playing out across the history of Nintendo. Um, and so this comes in post 1983 US arcade crash. Japan didn't have the arcade crash. Uh, uh, it, it leads to a decimation of arcade culture in the US. Japan, because they were already uh, charging the equivalent of about a dollar per play, pay could handle the decrease of uh, pay for play arcade games. And so the arcade culture is still going very strong in Japan. And now we move into the home console space. Uh, and the home console space doesn't decrease arcade culture because it's, it's a pedestrian uh, culture, right? Like they're moving around by feet, using public transportation, passing arcade games and playing in them. And there's a lot of interesting things to say about arcade culture in Japan. But as the family computer then moves to the US and takes up this now uh, high demand, low, uh, low supplied home console market that is left alone by, by the, the death of Atari, uh, it just explodes, right? And it explodes with Japanese IP such as uh, Super Mario Brothers and, um, and The Legend of Zelda. Uh, so Sega comes in, right? And Sega is another very interesting moment of is it Japanese or is it is it American? Uh, and, and we can kind of look at the history of Sega by itself, but it begins what we, we commonly understand as the console wars. And it's really the American marketing around Sega that leads to uh, this sort of hyper-masculine understanding of gamer in the US. Um, so meanwhile, Japan is not, or N Japan, Nintendo is not uh, competing on the same playing field. So Sega differentiates itself by being more powerful, more manly, more, more fast, more all the things, right? Uh, these, these advertisements are fascinating to look at and creates like this, what Carly Kosurik calls techno-masculinity. Like it's, it's this emergent moment of masculinity defined as, as technologically savvy, technologically um, uh, winnable. Um, and so when this happens, we now see the American market opens up to the competition introduced by uh, PlayStation, Xbox, uh, and a slew of others. And I'm skipping over like a lot of consoles that happened in the 90s as, as this is kind of um, 
exploring itself and then evening out, right? So uh, PlayStation is part of the Sony Corporation, which is a Jap Japanese corporation, but the Sony Corporation is already a global corporation at this moment. Sony is birthed, be uh, the PlayStation is birthed because of a disagreement between Nintendo and Sony. Uh, so in many ways, I laugh because Nintendo created its own competition. Uh, but it's interesting, you would think with the, the rise of Xbox, Xbox would have likewise done well in Japan, and it doesn't. And it has to do with, again, this sort of techno masculinity design aesthetic that happens in the US, where like the original Xbox controller is so big, Japanese people cannot comfortably hold it because uh, it's designed around white man hands. Um, and so in many ways, Xbox denied themselves an East Asian market right off the bat. Uh, and these Japanese companies understood that and went full, full hog trying to dominate the Southeast Asian and East Asian markets uh, in response. Um, and so now we come to a much more contemporary space of uh, Japan. Every time uh, Nintendo releases a console, people are like, this is not the console that will compete against like these high video graphics and these very, very powerful machines put out by Xbox and PCs and, and every time they kill it, right? And, and then, and it has to do with that old mentality of games for everyone. Japan has always seen games as a ubiquitous market. Uh, and so when uh, Wii gets released, they focus on women and especially middle-aged women. Like they really want, and, and I'm, I'm quoting here, they want mothers, um, that they, they see this as an untapped market. When they release the Switch, they're again going for ubiquitous play, not on your phone, but as a way of having families be able to gather around. So it's always a social activity. And so when we think about what Japan does to put pressure on the international video game market, it's always this sense of, of social interactivity. When you kind of come down into the types of games that they make, and Patrick, you were talking about that really quickly, and, and I know I'm running out of time, but uh, it's, it's also interesting because not only is Japan competing in this uh, in an economic sense, they're also competing this in soft, soft cultural power. Uh, and uh, a lot of this was in fact, not driven by policy, although such policies as Cool Japan have been created to try and capitalize on it. It's created at the, the moment of demand among youth cultures and liminal cultures. And so we see the rise of things like JRPGs, uh, Japanese role-playing games as differentiated from other RPGs, uh, which is interesting because the original, the first JRPG, uh, the Black Onyx, is created by Hank Rogers, an American who then moves to Japan. So the entire aesthetic of a JRPG is heavily informed by D&D and this, this American game designer who then goes over to Japan. Incidentally, he's also associated with Tetris, uh, a Russian game, and and uh, when we talk about the internationalizing of these things, how do you start delineating national borders in these highly international uh, complex things? And then you can look at things like visual novels and otome games, and more and more scholars are paying attention to that because they're killing it in Japan. Uh, and, and it's a place where women get to be uh, the dominant inscriptors of a cultural language, right? Starting with Keiko Arikawa when she founds her company that creates Angelique uh, as the first female visual novel kind of coming throughout the, the trajectory. Uh, and uh, we're now seeing the influence of visual novels in independent game cultures in the US. So, so these sort of cultural and uh, design aesthetic flows are still happening to this day and we're, and we're watching them emerge. Uh, so I, I will happily talk about any of these things more. Great, thank you, Jennifer, for that really comprehensive uh, overview of, of Japanese game history. Somebody who grew up playing uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System in the late 80s, I, I appreciate that, that background especially. Um, so I'll move, let's move from Japan to South Korea. Um, and I have a question for, for Si Young. So, um, I know you've studied uh, Asian game cultures, including the case of South Korea. Um, and so could you start off by telling us a little bit about the rise of game and media cultures in Korea, especially starting around 1997 in the wake of the financial crisis in East and Southeast Asia? Basically, are there um, any parallels between the rise of video games and maybe specifically esports, perhaps most notably StarCraft, 
uh, at that moment in the late 90s and the uptick in video game play in the United States following the 2008 financial crisis? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, the way that I think of video game culture in South Korea, and especially as we understand it today, it really does kind of begin in 1997 and after um, the financial crisis. And it really, um, the sort of history, because so to be clear, there are video games before 1997, but when we talk about the things that we associate it with today, which is something like esports or actual production, especially content production, this is all like a very 21st century phenomenon because we have to remember that up until this point, South Korea is not, neither producing you know, hardware nor software. And this is one of the reasons why I like to, to, that I think in the same way that Jennifer is talking about Japan is always you know, already international. There's a similar way in which that, you know, talking about South Korea in a lot of ways, especially in my research in terms of media, you have to talk about Japan. And so just to give a little backdrop to before you know, uh, 1997, in the 80s and 90s, South Korea actually had an incredibly vibrant um, arcade culture as well, clearly borrowed from you know, Japan. Um, not only the machinery, but also, you know, the, the majority of the software is coming from Japan and South Korea. And, and I read that as actually the sort of base that, that the foundation that which esports and, and PC game culture is sort of built on, that that was the sort of, um, the, 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 you know, was, was the groundwork. Like just to give anecdotal um, sort of um, uh, an example, when I was in middle school, there were four arcades within, within my schools, um, like within walking distance. There were two arcades within walking distance of my home, of my house. So again, Jennifer sort of mentioned this, this sort of culture, which kind of relates to, you know, this um, kind of, uh, you know, not only the sort of dank and seedy sort of masculinist culture that you were mentioning before in American arcades as well, but also this kind of like, you know, wandering sort of you wander in, you wander out, but then the other sort of important kind of um, component of this, and it was brought up in the first, um, in, in, in the previous episode, is that these are also like places of refuge for, because in, in South Korea, like games have to be talked about in relation to, you know, this kind of really intense imperative for education, you know, what Michael Seth has famously uh, called education fever, which is one of the reasons that, that even though there are consoles and, you know, it already starts to get really complicated because we're talking about, you know, in the backdrop of, of, of Japanese colonialism in, in, in the context of South Korea and the fact that Japanese, you know, culture and media was ostensibly illegal until 1998. So a lot of this stuff is coming through, you know, you know, the black market and whatnot, but, but still has this like, giant presence in South Korea. So there is console culture, um, but it's, it's, it's very, 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 very minimal as opposed to Japan and South Korea, mostly because you know, there was this um, really strong association with, um, with, with, with video games and, um, you know, basically children not studying, that they're, they're being delinquent, that it's going to lead them down these sort of bad paths. So, um, you know, and this is all going on in 1997, the, the Asian financial crisis hit, uh, it begins in Thailand. In the context of Korea, it's mostly due to corporate borrowing and trade deficit. And then, you know, um, in 98, the IMF uh, issues a $58 billion um, uh, bailout, right, to a bailout package. But the, the, the issue is that it comes with a whole sort of slew of, of strings attached to the package. And, and what those really kind of amount to is, is further liberalizing the Korean economy. And, and what that ultimately means is corporate and labor restructuring, and especially opening up the, com the, the country to foreign investment. Now the kind of fallout of that, which you know we're still sort of you know with South Korea still sort of like feeling to this day, just the immense amount of layoffs, the absolute decimation of labor unions, and then just deregulation from top to bottom. Now this produces a sort of like a knot, right? And that knot then kind of um, is is where where you know um, uh, South Korean game culture kind of spawns from, or you know let's say modern South Korean uh, game culture. So for one, you have, um, because of the massive amount of, of layoffs, you have um, a, a, a giant newly unemployed labor force, right? Um, and, and, and you see this in, in narratives around the turn, turn of the century. I mean, you know, and you see this internationally of like, um, of, of, of men who are lying to their families that, you know, they've been laid off, but they, they, 
you, you see it in Japan too, right? They go through the motions of, of, of um, as if they're still employed. So a lot of them, you know, have nowhere to go. You see uh, uh, um, that the government gives up its uh, monopoly on, on the telecommunications industry. And so that becomes privatized. That in, in conjunction with, with, um, with Kim Dae-jung's sort of, uh, you know, intense mission, not only for, for globalization, which ultimately means neoliberalization, but this idea of like the wired Korea, you know, which is a big talking point to this day of how, you know, how quick the, and, and how, you know, um, expansive uh, uh, internet uh, 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 accesses in the country, right? And, and, and it's pretty great. I, I remember the, going on the subway and it's like, I have Wi-Fi on a subway, it was alien to me. But then, you know, in 1998, Blizzard releases StarCraft and, and I can talk about StarCraft till the cows come home, but it's just, it, it's fascinating in a number of ways because, from what I understand, StarCraft was never never um, thought to be uh, a really killer software. They, it was more like a, a kind of stopgap game between Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3. But for some reason, and I don't know the answer, you know, um, it just it just takes off like wildfire. While this is happening, you have a new form of leisure called PC Bang, and and room culture is this thing in South Korea, you know, in relation to the kind of Confucian culture and always being wary of other people. So this idea of leisure and private spaces, so karaoke, but like in, you know, like the like norebang, right? Like in the rooms, right? Drinking, all, all sorts of activities, right? Even watching films in like private rooms, that kind of thing. So this this starts to emerge around like 1998. But the number is is that in 1998 there were only 100 in the country. Within two years, that explodes to 30,000. So 30,000 internet cafes in the country. So, you know, now they're everywhere. And, and the, clearly they kind of like take the place of arcades. Like you're hard pressed to find arcades now in the country. You can throw a stone and find a, a PC bomb, right? And then what happens is that um, pro gamer Lee gi um, uh, ID Samjung, he wins a major um, ladder tournament, uh, an international um, StarCraft tournament in 1999. And then, and then one of the, the, the telecommunications companies, Cornet, um, actually shoots a commercial and, 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 you know, it's like one of the, it's, it's one of those things like people of that generation will remember the commercial because it heavily promoted, you know, um, uh, Lee or, or Samjang as world champion. And it was this thing, it's this one of these weird things, I think that, you know, um, I mean, does the U.S. get still get excited about being number one at the international box office, but, right? But in the context of South Korea, like no one cares about StarCraft or video games, but you say world champion and people, are, well, you know, people pay attention. And so these things all kind of come together. Um, and then that really sort of, you know, um, that's where esports really emerges. Now, when I, when I think about esports, when I approach esports, I am, I'm talking very specifically about the sort of template and, and there, it's, like a, it's like the spectacle, right? That we associate with esports. And there's always the sort of built-in incredulity, right? Which, which goes back to the kind of, um, uh, uh, the idea of legitimacy, right? That, 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 and Tara works on this quite a bit, um, as opposed to this kind of like assumed, uh, you know, a validity of sports, traditional sports. There's, there's, it's just like, you know, for, for a lot of, for, you know, a lot of people, the kind of spectacle of seeing, you know, two kind of, um, you know, not terribly, let's say big, you know, two, two young kind of thinner, you know, Asian men, at computers in front of thousands of people is still something that a lot of people find like kind of you know ridiculous and hilarious. And I get it, I get it. But that's what I what I think about in terms of esports. So as opposed to a lot of kind of critics and, and pundits that, that point out that esports, you know, they try and find the origins with you know in Iowa and, and 1981 and Twin Galaxies and arcade culture. I think there are links and connections, but I don't think that, that like esports as you and I understand just today that that's really where the genealogy is, where they're really drawing from. No, they're, they're, they're packing people in stadiums, right? And so, you know, the other kind of, I think similar, you know, other thread would be like fighting games and especially Evo after 1996 and into the 21st century. Again, you know, these things are kind of like crossing over, but I don't think it's the same thing, which is why, you know, to talk about like, to kind of get into the genre question for me, genre and, and the sort of, you know, multimedia question, I think of esports really as, as, as started by, you know, which, and, and again, the explosion of um, just like multimedia in South Korea around the turn of the century, 
you wouldn't have esports without um, cable television in South Korea, which again really kind of only emerges around this period. And specifically, it's it's the establishment of two cable cha cha channels dedicated, you know, to video games. So you need the content, right? And that's on and and so um, on Game Net and NBC Game, and them establishing the two major star leagues, the StarCraft League. So that's on Game Net Star League in 2000, and then NBC Game StarCraft League in 2002. Without those, we don't have esports e as we know it. Now, you know, esport. Now, to get into the genre question, um, it's it's much more diverse than it used to be. But for me, it's like the, the clear genealogy of esports. You have to go to StarCraft, and then you 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 know, by way of Warcraft and and the mods, right? The defense of the ancient mods in in the, in the South Korean context of chaos, which is never which never gets discussed in game studies. Um, it's, it's by way of those that then we lead to Dota and we lead to League of Legends and now we are where we are. And, and I like to talk about League of Legends quite a bit, partially because it's, it's such a like great object that really talks about like how a lot of this, you know, in, in the kind of East Asian American interchange, how you have it both ways. So you have like that history established in South Korea, you have these genres and the built-in audiences but then, for example, like um, the kind of what leading up to Dota and League of Legends, the culture of um, RTSs and um, and the arena games, again, like something like Chaos, gets completely erased, right? Um, uh, I think that, I think that about gets everything that you've brought so far. So I'll 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 and I'll end there. That, that, that's really great. Uh, thanks so much for that. I completely agree with that uh, that genealogy. And I want to come back to some of the economic questions later. But because we're already talking about esports, I'm going to turn back to Tara and stick with that thread a little bit and also pick up on one of the questions that came from the audience at the same time. Um, so Tara, I, I know some of your uh, recent research has taken up esports. And of course, uh, very recently on August 30th of this year, uh, China introduced new rules that children under the age of 18 can't play video games for more than three hours a week. Um, and one of the immediate reactions to that was that China would no longer be able to sustain a popular and lucrative esports scene after those new restrictions. But of course, you know, there are complications to that. For instance, Chinese esports organizations have often poached uh, top Korean players who could earn larger paychecks in China for playing games like League of Legends. Um, and moreover, this isn't the first set of restrictions that China uh, has put forward around video game play. So I wonder, what do you see as the implications of China's rules for the future of esports, both uh, in Asia and around the world? Yeah, thanks. There's so much to say here. And, and I wonder if by way of introduction, I can kind of pick up on something that Sang finished with, which is about how specifically sort of in video game culture, how gender and um, this sort of techno masculinity really crosses over with race and culture and how Asians sort of, especially Asian men, long stereotyped in racial terms as a kind of inadequate masculinity or like you're you know, smaller, sort of nerdier in that way. Um, and this actually connects back to what Jennifer was saying about the implication of these sort of smaller Japanese hands, right? What does that mean um, for esports and the status of Asia as a um, growing world power, not only economically, but in terms of um, dominating championships in esports? And, you know, China has, has um, arisen and become, you know, dominant, maybe second only to South Korea in a very short time. So, you know, you see the way that this shapes esports culture in the US through a kind of combination of pretty explicitly racialized wistfulness and also resentment towards the idea that these Asian men are not only highly technically skilled, and it's not just men, but, you know, in terms of the kind of, you know, market discourse it is, uh, not just that they have technical skill, but that they are objects of desire, that they are celebrities, that they are treated as professional athletes would be in the US, uh, also a highly racialized idea. Um, and so I think that this, this really ties into what the implications are gonna be if China's esports scene is also gutted. So um, Professor Chung talked about this in the last episode, but just for those who aren't as familiar with it, the new ban sets uh, or sort of increases the restrictions that were already in place. So the three hours per week um, of video game, of online video game play for those under 18 is I think something like 
one hour per day between certain hours in the evening on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and public holidays. So um, this, you know, as Professor Chung was saying, has to do partly with which games are seen as socially legitimate or not, or not. And before video games, of course, in China and other countries, you know, you've seen this for years. Think about the, you know, the very vacillating um, national response to something like mahjong or ping pong, right? So in the immediate, you know, in the mid-century days, uh, ping pong has kind of heralded the idea of Mao playing in the caves, right, um, as an almost scholarly activity then it is um, seen as quite the opposite in the ages of the Cultural Revolution. Then we come back in the 1970s with something like ping pong diplomacy. And now, um, you know, we've seen that, uh, that undulation happen a couple more times. So video games too, I think are, you know, and esports are crucial to understand in the context of what that means for Chinese nationalism right now um, and how video games relate to that kind of patriotism. So the obvious contradiction that's created here is that, uh, first of all, esports was officially recognized as a sport by China not too long ago. Um, but in order to get good at esports, right, um, it requires not only long hours of training and practice, uh, but the peak years are, you know, we're talking something like 16 to 22. It's very young. And of course, that means many years before that, being able to practice um, and develop, especially through, you know, official training schools. So it's a way kind of, of expressing, and this goes back to what Zhang was saying, sort of what is the path to the good life, right? Um, and the good life here in, in a kind of neoliberal capital context, is it, you know, video games and professionalization that way, or is it the Gao Gao, higher education, right? Um, a specific kind of education. Um, so, you know, as of yesterday, I think I was looking at it, there was still no clear um, directive on whether or not esports teams were going to be exempt, whether there were going to be deferrals for certain ones. That seems almost impossible because so many aspiring esports players um, are you know, unrecognized as yet. So the last thing to say there though, is that it's important to see some of these restrictions as a shift in placing the onus, not on parents, not on the state, but on game companies themselves to regulate and surveil um, children to make sure that they, you know, who's playing is who they say are playing. So the idea that circumvention through, you know, logging in with your parents' ID, uh, you know, Tencent, one of the largest companies there has, you know, there are talks about using um, maybe webcams to be able to double check, right, that uh, who's playing is the one um, according to the image. So, you know, that, that has quite a lot of implications, but one last thing to say is that it's been very interesting seeing theorizations or speculations online about how these changes, because they only relate to something like online gaming, might mean that let's say China becomes the next um, Street Fighter esports, you know, world power because it's an offline gaming um, community, so. Great. Tara, thank you for that. I know that's a question that's been on a lot of people's minds, so that's a really helpful set of clarifications. Um, I'm going to turn back to Jennifer now. And, and Jennifer, I, I want to circle back to Kara's earlier comments about addiction and also Se Young's remarks on uh, game economics. And you focus not merely on game cultures, but also on the video game industry. And uh, one critique of video games has to do with how they can operate as a form of gambling especially in online games and mobile games that contain loot boxes, right? So for non-gamers in the audience, loot boxes are uh, randomized selections of virtual items that a player purchases in order to improve their performance or, or their experience in a game. Um, in fact, you know, video game addiction has uh, been a major category of critique as Tara was talking about the phrase spiritual opium has been, has been used many times now uh, to describe video game play. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about some of the differences of regulation, even beyond the recent uh, Chinese um, uh, regulations of video game play between uh, Asian countries versus the United States? Yeah, this is so interesting because I think whenever you see regulation, you actually see um, uh, cultural moral, moral panics, right? So if, if you look at this Chinese instance right now, uh, and I'll, I'll use that to then uh, start moving across, right? This, this Chinese instance right now of trying to regulate the number of hours. China's tried to do this multiple times with Wangbo's, 
with the console bans, right? Like with, with multiple ways of, of attempting to regulate it. And it, it's an anxiety about education. And it's no accident that the policies around these new regulations about how long you can play are handed down at the same policies, at the same time that policies about new educational priorities get handed down. And, and eradicating, or not eradicating, but uh, trying to limit or get rid of like these after school study programs, right? Um, and to focus on more creative activities. Uh, in, in Japan, you start seeing these regulations similarly very early on. It, it, in fact, in some ways mirrors the anxieties that America has with the, with the arcades, right? That they're trying to limit when kids can go to arcades, when they can play. They have policies about prostitution that they try to uh, put onto arcades in order to start policing them in very particular ways. And then later on, they, they likewise attempt to police um, to police the, the games in, in the homes, right? And, and they, they create rating systems and these track with kind of similarly to the, to the US when we create the ESRB as a means to self-police, Japan creates a different rating system to self-police. Uh, what's interesting about them is that they pull it apart. Arcades are, are self-policed by one and, uh, and PC games and mobile games are policed by another. And the, the, the group that, that regulates the PC and mobile games are way more freewheeling, right? Like this, these are the, the media and the, the platforms that you see um, sex games, rape simulation games, gambling games, like that thrives over into this much less regulated market than, than the console games. Um, and so a number of years ago, there was, again, this, this moral panic, right? Like this, this extreme worry about uh, addictive behaviors in and around loot boxes uh, and gacha games, right? Uh, and in, in Japanese, there's, there's a desire there, there's a word that expresses the desire to, to got to catch them all, right? To Pokemon these things up. And it's kompu gacha, right? Complete gacha. I, I collected all the things. Uh, and it's a mechanic that uh, is perfected through telemetric data. It's per perfected through uh, gambling-like design choices. And it was leading to, um, to salary men, the, the primary earners of the household, sometimes gam gambling away on these loot boxes uh, anywhere from $20,000 to $100,000 equivalent a month. Uh, and because of these high, high case moments, the Japanese government had to step in and, and try to regulate that. Uh, it's questionable how well these regulations work um, whenever you attend to trying to regulate entertainment technologies, people will always find a way around it, um, in part because it's, it's insistive technology, but in part because of an ideology about a right to consume. I have the right to do this. It's my money, and you can't tell me any different. And so looking at esports, you see similar types of regulations trying to come in, uh, in and around gambling as a peripheral activity. Uh, not just in esports, but also as as um, video game sports platforms as predictors of uh, physical sports, like using Madden to predict uh, football games, right? And, and the gambling that happens then in and around that, or fantasy football in the U.S. Uh, you'll see a lot of gambling in and around that. So I'm happy to talk more about gambling. It's it's fascinating because people part with their money. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and people think of games as, as merely pastimes or entertainment, but there, of course, is this heavy uh, uh, component of, of money, of economics that goes into it. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and go back to, to C. Young. Um, and one thing I really like about your research is you frequently take a comparative media approach. Uh, in other words, you often think about the relationship of a medium like film to one like video games. And needless to say, the film and game and music industries aren't fully separate in the transmedia environment that we have today. Um, and so across Asia, uh, how have you thought about the relationship of video game cultures to the cultures surrounding other media? So, you know, for instance, at the level of influence, we could think of 
the impact of the martial arts tradition on contemporary video games, but there are also many other examples. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Um, let me see. I think one of the most um, fascinating places that you'll see this is actually South Korean television. Um, and especially in not so much fiction and narrative. Um, I've been thinking about this lately quite a bit, but um, in, in nonfiction, it's not quite reality te television, although I guess technically it would be reality television, but, but one of the most predominant you know, genres is, is called um, the variety show, right? And, and, I, and as, again, like as far as I can sense, it's another thing that they get from um, Japan. Um, but, uh, you know, I think for someone who's not really familiar with, with South Korean television, um, a lot of these shows can feel very busy. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of editing. There's a lot of production. I actually think that's where a lot of the, where, where that's what really makes the product kind of interesting. But so oftentimes they'll have a lot of, um, kind of musical flourishes or sound effects. And a lot of times those are coming from, from video games. Um, you know, like you'll hear Mario kind of sound effects very, fairly regularly. But even conceptually, you'll hear a lot of um, sort of, of ideas that are coming, not only from like games um, uh, kind of broadly, um, but very specifically too. And, and, and I'm, my memory is, is failing me right now, but th and this isn't this isn't video this isn't coming from video games, but it's related to video games. Just well, you see it in League of Legends, right? So just to give you a sense of like how how far the kind of um, the rabbit hole goes in South Korean television, you'll often hear the term ace, and is usually used um, to describe you know if it's a team team uh, competition, it's usually describing they use it in League of Legends differently, but they use it in in, in this context as the sort of star player. So instead of MVP, so clearly like the parameters and the coordinates are not coming from American sports, they're coming from something else. Now, where is ACE coming from? ACE is, um, I can't prove this, but my, my gut would tell me it comes from the, the popularity of, of um, Inoue's manga Slam Dunk in the 90s, again in the 90s. And, not, and you, see, you hear that uh, regularly, uh, where, where especially like, for example, one of the main characters, Rukawa, is, is referred to as the ACE of the team. So you get a sense of like, I'm sure that not everyone in the country has read Slam Dunk, but it's become proliferated, even if it doesn't come from Slam Dunk. My understanding of it is that it comes from, it goes back to, to um, 78 and, or 81, and it goes back to the original Gundam, but it might even go back further. But that already not only kind of is another, for me, another one of these pet examples of the kind of interchange between Japan and Korea, but even further to go back to Jennifer's work, how much, you know, like, you, like in order to understand Japanese media production in the 21st, like 20th and 21st century, like we have to go back to like, like the wars, right? Like World War II and World War I. So, you know, if we think about like, you know, ACE and kind of like the prototypical ACE in, in Japanese media, and you think about Shar Aznable, it's like the ACE pilot, the Red Comet, which is based on the Red Baron from World War I, right? So you see those kind of like rich. So, in, you know, what you're talking about really for me is, is kind of, really just tracing all these things so that can we ultimately go back to like, what is the actual historical referent, you know, and going, you know, pushing against, you know, a kind of cultural essentialist and, and, and orientalist reading. And just very briefly, you know, the kind of economic side of it is that um, what we see on the kind of level of the text, what we're really talking about is that um, in the case of Korea, uh, media after 1997, so the like, you know, what is South Korea now known for, you know, to the point that, um, uh, you know, even, even, even Japan, which like Korea basically followed their model of, but then cool Japan is now like thinking about the Korean model, right? It's, it's, it's music, video games um, and film for a brief period and then Parasite kind of, you know, re resuscitates Korean cinema. But all three of these industries were ones that really only developed after the financial crisis and, and partially because the government were, were, uh, was challenging um, the, 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 the major Chebol conglomerates, which really had a stranglehold on, on, on industry in the country. So for example, like Samsung and Hyundai would be the big ones. And what that meant was that there would be, there was support for smaller businesses. This is happening 
um, as venture capital starts to, to become injected in these industries. And, and the government support is also dependent on a shift in the mindset, right? That, um, that uh, media is, so, and this goes back to the educational thing, right? Where it's like this idea, this very old idea in South Korea that, that, that culture is a low, like a low kind of class thing, right? That it's, you know, like music, art, you know, it's not, that it's not, um, let's say as legitimate as, 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 as becoming successful through education, right? Um, so, you know, um, being an entertainer is not this kind of, it, it's a, it, can, it, it can be considered a shameful thing, right? I think even to this day, those sort of attitudes can prevail, right? As opposed to becoming, I don't know, a doctor or something or, or a government official. But um, there's, a, there's a key shift before in the, not only in, in the Kim Dae-jung presidency, but in, in Kim young sams presidency, there's a famous Jurassic Park incident where um, a government official gives a report to, to, to Kim young sam that says that Jurassic Park made more money um, than an entire year of Hyundai exports. And so, you know, the light bulb goes off, you know, well, how can we get into that? Like, we want a piece of that pie, right? And so this shift in the idea that these are actually international commodities, right? Um, and so uh, that's why they start injecting film or injecting, you know, money, especially into film. But there's a reason why, you know, K-pop is on the billboard um, Parasite is at the Academy Awards and we're talking about esports. It's all happening in this context. And I know every, um, at least everyone on the panel can kind of relate to this, but for me personally, this is one of the reasons I'm always talking about economics is because it's very easy for us to, to talk about the artistic side, the cultural side, the front facing as consumers, right? Um, you know, our students, that's what they're familiar with, but it's like, you know, on the production end, and especially when we're talking about state support, this is something very, very different, which leads to, I think, very, very different avenues and, and, and ways of thinking about them. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe we'll do a couple more questions. Um, I wanna shift uh, to, back to Tara and move from economics maybe to politics or sociopolitics. So an audience member asked us a question about video games and diplomacy, but I'll ask a slightly broader version of that question, uh, which is, um, what do you make of video game culture as a political space, right? Certainly uh, online gaming spaces can be extremely conservative and discriminatory, right? One sees these spaces overrun with um, xenophobic nationalism, sexism, homophobia, uh, and racism. On the other hand, right, gaming spaces can sometimes also support protests. So for example, um, we've talked about this in 2019, the American video game developer Blizzard punished uh, a Hong Kong esports player who played the online game Hearthstone for, support for supporting the Hong Kong protests during a streaming event. Um, and this prompted a boycott and a letter from uh, US congressional representatives to Blizzard. But then kind of more generally, how do you think of game culture as a political or politicized space? Yeah, and the Hong Kong example, I think, is a really good one because, you know, that Blitz Chung, that, um, that esports player example that you brought up is actually what ended up spawning, according to um, a number of game designers, some of the very games, some of these very protest games that featured um, during the time of the Hong Kong protests last year. And I think that it really showcases um, the broad ways in which video games can be used both as a source of political propaganda, I suppose, um, in the positive and negative senses of that term. So as a nationalist tool, as an activist tool, um, and as one, especially um, in the case of the Hong Kong protests that are going on over a long period of time interrupted by COVID, as a means of maintaining connection. This goes back to what we were talking about with COVID, as a means of maintaining um, motivation. I think, you know, to say something about the way that games as political spaces um, draw very much on, I think, a kind of transmedia, translingual um, tradition that Sang was talking about. So it was really fascinating for me to watch. Um, I had read something about how during the protests, sometimes people were using video game language to make sense of how to um, conduct themselves during the protest. So they were saying things like, we need to disrupt the police spawn points basically, um, and a way in which that kind of reversal um, means that 
there's a long tradition, right, of this discourse in uh, the US about how games that are first person shooters, basically training people to be uh, military, right, or um, adopt police perspectives, police tactics, etc. But here we're seeing a kind of reversal that I thought was fascinating. Um, but also how these games then create um, political responses and kind of shape templates for the aesthetics of those political responses. So to give an example, um, you know, a few years ago, this game Yellow Umbrella was a relatively um, simple mobile game. It came out, I think, on Android and became quite popular, um, created as obviously a, a sympathetic to protesters and you play as protesters um, defending, you know, yourself from oncoming police um, with tear gas. The interesting thing there is that there's no combat in a traditional sense. You're purely defending yourself, right, using umbrellas. What was interesting then is you couldn't really exactly call it a response game, um, but you know you could in terms of the time and release. So for example, um, a game came out that has been kind of roughly translated something like everyone beat the traitors, right? And this is not a game that came out by the Chinese government and you couldn't really even say it's endorsed, it's creditless. It's, you know, positively, it was positively framed in media outlets, uh, some prominent media outlets there. And in this one, very similar aesthetic, it's a sort of very simple two-dimensional one. Both of them are using kind of caricatures of the other side. But what I found really fascinating, there's a couple of things to point out in this one, is that in the kind of introductory narrative, it's not a cutscene, it's more like a comic um, introducing the game. There are, uh, it shows white people kind of, you know, Americans, let's say maybe North Americans, giving money to the protesters as a form of kind of interference, right? So there's a clear narrative being constructed here that the motivations of the protesters are not merely economic, but a form of international interference. The second part is that among um, the protesters, so in this game, instead of defending with umbrellas, you can attack um, the protesters, that among the two, um, you know, heavily caricatured uh, Joshua Wong and Martin Lee, one of the other figures that you attack is um, Qin Hui, who is this, um, you know, Song Dynasty era trader, right? Like a famous Chinese trader from history. And the anachronism is obvious, right? He's sitting there with, he has a very different um, appearance and he's sitting there with hands bound um, and the wooden board. And I think that that was one of the most interesting ways to think about how political here also means creating a narrative through this game in which they're basically, you know, not in any subtle way saying history is going to be against these protesters, right? And it, you know, within the long history of China and what we'll see in the future, this is how they will be um, remembered. And so to communicate that through a game, it's hard to think of a way that you would be able to communicate that um, without that sort of complicity too of the player or the, the perceived agency being given. Hey, thank you, thank you, Tara. Um, uh, I'll, I'll turn back to, to Jennifer and I, I guess keep the political conversation going in some ways. So uh, Jennifer, uh, before we were talking about spending money in games through things like, like gambling, for instance, or regulation, but I also wanted to ask you about game labor um, so in recent years, we've heard more about unjust labor practices in video game companies. So for example, uh, sexual harassment charges amidst the Me Too movement online, uh, but there have also been countless cases of exploitative labor practices that have had to do with uh, unsustainably long work hours, for instance. Um, so how do you think about video game labor, which I know is a big topic, but both among developers and players across Asia and the US? Yeah, um, so to talk about labor in Japan is to talk about not just video games, but, but across the different media because they're so transmedia dependent. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking about labor with animation, with comics, uh, with television and film, right? Uh, Japan, Japan has long struggled with their visual artists and paying them well. Right, and this is in video games, but most most um, most news articles will focus on the animation industry. But but these are the same people, right? Uh, and we know that they are paid less less than what we would consider a living wage. They're paid like anything equivalent to two to five dollars an hour, uh, and that they're working ridiculously long hours that they'll work up to 16 hours a day. They'll sleep under their desk. They'll sleep in comic uh, 
uh, comic cafes or or game cafes because they can't afford to have um, an apartment or a house and they're too ashamed to live with their family. And this, these are extreme examples, right? Uh, but it's an extreme example that similar to the US uh, takes advantage of the passion that people have to be a creative individual in these areas. So the US has this, we often call it crunch culture, but uh, we, we do know that uh, early career people uh, are often taking unpaid internships or very low paid introductory work, that they are working extremely long hours uh, and that these games are then released uh, often at the expense of these workers. Um, and, and policies haven't come down from the government in either country to attend to this, which is, which is horrific. Um, and in fact, if we, if we move over into South Korea, Japan is able to continue to participate in this sort of thing as is the US because of a heavy dependence on the same practices in South Korea, especially around animators, uh, where they, they subcontract some of this work out to South Koreans. Uh, in the US, we see uh, attrition from the game industry to be on average around 33. People realize that their passion can't pay their bills. Um, we see a similar trajectory in Japan. Um, there are companies in Japan that try to counter this, of course. Um, uh, Kyoto Animation is like one of these very famous examples where they decided to, to pay living wages, have reasonable work hours, but it was because it, it was focusing on women workers and that they knew that women workers had a responsibility to the home um, and, and lifetime employment, right? Uh, so if we, if we talk about labor practices on that end, it's, it's, it's bleak. Um, if we talk about labor practices um, among labor, right? The people who play and then participate in labor for free, uh, now we get into like some really tricky ethics, right? Uh, that if it is my hobby and I am creating objects because it is my hobby and then I can start making money off of it, am I being exploited? If it is my hobby and I just give those objects away for free and the company benefits it, but I, I get, um, social capital, am I being exploited? Uh, if it is my hobby um, and I'm, I'm just doing whatever it is that I wanna do because I'm writing an article right now about black game creators because I wanna see more representation. Uh, is it my responsibility to ensure more representation of looks like me? Um, if it's not something I enjoy, but I do it in the case of gold farming, right? Going back to Tara's point earlier, I do it because I'm so desperate to make some money. Uh, is it ethical, right? Like, are you now exploiting a labor market that's part of uh, this contract gig labor? Uh, and and where where is that line uh, at any time? Where does it stop being hobbyist labor and move into gig labor? Uh, and and how do we have to attend to that? Because I don't think we have to monetize our hobbies all the time. Um, but uh, anytime that money gets involved, now you're talking about the extraction of value and where is that value getting extracted from? Uh, and, and those are interesting questions to ask. I hope that answers your question, Patrick. Yeah, it does. I mean, these are such fascinating questions that we could have an entire two hour program just dedicated to that. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question because we're running out of time and I'll go back to, to say young. Um, and our, our next episode of this series is gonna take up uh, video game genres, but in order to get to some of those specific questions, it's worth thinking a little bit about hardware as well, or even platforms, right? So, you know, one fundamental point is that game cultures differ from country to country in terms of what platforms people use to play video games. So, for example, you know, consoles are more popular in the United States versus mobile games throughout much of Asia or even throughout much of the rest of the world. Uh, we also have PC games, we have transmedia games of various sorts. Um, could you just uh, take us home by telling us a little bit about um, platforms and hardware differences and why that's important for the study of games? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as I, as I mentioned previously, you know, I think here in the US we are predominantly um, a, a console culture, 
Um, and, you know, we talked elsewhere, not, not right now, but we had talked elsewhere about, you know, what about the parallels about um, how, how, like you guys talked about it quite a bit in the first episode, but how does American game culture get to the point where, you know, GTA 5 becomes the, the highest selling entertainment product of all time. Um, and from, at least from what I can tell, it feels less like 2008. I think 2008, there's an uptick. Pandemic is very good to the industry, right, globally. But my sense of it very much comes from, um, it seems to be around like, you know, uh, again, the same sort of period around the turn of the century with, with especially with the internet. I think Microsoft getting into the game is, is really important. But I also, I'm, you know, I, I'm gonna refer to um, Thomas Schatz talking about um, how the PlayStation 2 sold as many units as it did, you know, a record-breaking console because it was bundled with Spider-Man 2, right? So, and this goes back to your last question. So this like, you know, idea of like media convergence, right? So, and especially in the American context, I think media convergence uh, um, after conglomeration and, and after the internet really blows the kind of doors open. Um, the other, and this goes back to my other research, but, and I also think that nine, like we can't talk about video game culture in the US without 9-11 because the FPS was not the predominant, I think, genre, you know, until after 9-11 and Call of Duty, you know, goes from the, from, from World War II and in, into, um, you know, modern warfare, I guess that's a really kind of bad pun, but, um, and then in 2008, I think that what, what, uh, you know, I'm kind of talking about in 1997 in South Korea, um, where you have a lot of people and, you know, the, the sort of floor just kind of bottoms out. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence. Well, I mean, that's a kind of weak way of putting it because I've, I've already written on this, but I, I do think that we can equate the sort of, you know, um, mon you know, monstrous success of Fortnite and PUBG and the Battle Royale genre, which again gets us back to Japan and the collapse of the bubble economy and Battle Royale with this sort of zero sum experience of just not, you know, they're not being too much work, you know, not enough or, you know, too much prep, not enough work and, and the sort of zero sum game that we're all experiencing right now, which I think feeds into the anxiety of young people. Um, but yeah, so, so th that's already kind of, but, you know, talking about consoles specifically in, 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 in the US. In the context of South Korea, um, again, mostly because of the sort of stigma against consoles, one, one, and this very much links up with Jennifer's work, one kind of um, exception is how, how well the Nintendo DS sold in South Korea. Um, everyone had one. And it's precisely because of this incredibly smart, very, very shrewd marketing campaign that this was not only an educational tool, which again, like links back to the other, earlier stuff, but also not just for, you know, young men and boys, right? Um, but you know, far and wide, I would say South Korea as a, as a gaming culture is absolutely PCs and, and mobile, right? Consoles, are, I think, are a far distant third. You know, they exist, but, but barely. Um, and again, PCs, however, took on pretty, pretty early and pretty well because it was marketed kind of um, as an educational tool. So people were already kind of becoming familiarized. And then with PC culture and not, you know, like, like PC bang culture. So people going to the internet cafes and that dictates what sort of genres, but one of the questions pointed this out too, that is the incredibly important distinction I think um, is that this, we're talking about an online multiplayer kind of culture. Uh, whether it's MMORPGs, whether it's shooters, and especially the, you know, um, the, the MOBAs, the, the battle arena games, that's what we're talking about. Similarly, you know, because it is a wired country, um, and, and that's why a lot of, you know, distant observers um, kind of scrutinize it in these sort of techno-orientalist ways, you know, because people are, are you know, smartphone and cell phone adoption was, was pretty quick and pretty universal. So, and, and you know, people are constantly on the go, right? Especially in, in a metropolitan area like Seoul. So people are on their phones a lot, you know? And, and so, yeah, like games have, have been able to sort of um, kind of get a foothold in, again, on a sort of broad level um, that, that, that it's not restricted to any sort of specific demographic. Um, but yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you to all of the panelists, Tara, Jennifer, Siang, uh, for those uh, for this amazing conversation. And I'm going to turn it back to Mark now uh, for some uh, announcements about future events. Great, Patrick. Thank you so much for assembling such a great panel of experts and Tara and Jennifer and say, I hope we get to see you again sometime in the future. There's so much to talk about.
in this space. Um, I think we could have gone on for quite some time. We have a poll coming up. It should be showing up on your screen. Uh, let me tell you a little bit of, more about the program that we have for next week. Patrick will be uh, joining us again, and he'll be moderating and exploring the various genres, as he said, of uh, video games in Asia. So if you enjoyed this evening's program, next week's webinar will feature, uh, again, three speakers you'll most definitely want to hear from. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and the UN Campus website for further information. And please register for next Thursday's event. Uh, next Thursday will be at 8.30 p.m. Hong Kong time. So we'll revert to our, uh, our usual time. We look forward to seeing you on September 16th. Good night, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.